As the 80s began, milk production in Michigan and across the country was growing faster than consumer sales. The government was buying substantial volumes of butter and milk powder under the Farm Bill Support Program. MMPA forms a milk division, and in a merger with Milk Producers Dairy Company, acquires plants in Adrian and Seabwing. McDonald Dairy Division remained a separate division. In 1981, MMPA locates to a larger lease space in Southfield. Elwood Kirkpatrick, a kindy dairy farmer, becomes president. And in 1985, Walt Washi becomes general manager. Had an opportunity to work for Walt when he was the general manager here, and uh, he certainly laid down some foundations that uh, today we still see reap some of the rewards of. One of the, um, the real challenges that we faced right at the time that uh, Jack Barnes retired and Walt Washi took over as general manager, we had um, inherited the McDonald Cooperative. The financial woes of the McDonald Cooperative, uh, McDonald Dairy, did not improve that much. And so we had a dilemma. We needed to do something to solve that problem, uh, either make that, that uh, McDonald Dairy a profitable site of the business or divest of that business. And so we had the opportunity to divest of McDonald Dairy. During that time, it was very challenging because you know, MNPA had bottom line losses, membership was, was concerned, and so it was a challenge to get that, that situation resolved, but we did it and, it and it worked out really well. We decided we had to have a certain return on our investment. Dairy farmers had invested millions of dollars in this organization and really weren't recouping uh, much return on that investment. So we made a determined effort to change our product mix. Basically, we were selling milk to the food handlers, and then we made butter and non-fat dry milk, which were very low return products. And so we went out in the industry, uh, contacted people like Pepperidge Farms, uh, Edie's Ice Cream, uh, M&M's Candy in Chicago, and a lot of people don't think of dairy products when they think of candies. But we became a major supplier of sweetened condensed milk to M&M candies in Chicago. Uh, Pepperidge Farms out east, we delivered a lot of the raw ingredients for their bakery products and so on. And it was through that that we were squeezing out a lot more per hundred weight of milk that came in than we were when we simply made uh, butter and non-fat dry milk. And then I guess the biggest change we made was an outfit called Leprino Foods which has become a, a really well-known outfit in the dairy industry. We got together with them in Denver, Colorado. They wanted to build a new plant here. They didn't have a lot of money to do it with. So we kind of went out on a limb. We had by that time built up some capital. We borrowed some more capital, built a new plant over at Allendale, remodeled a plant up at Remus, and really started going to town. And cheese, as you know, was coming into its own uh, consumption was going up dramatically. Pizza was uh, very uh, coming into its own, increased sales. And that kind of put us over the top to where we started making five, six, seven million dollars a year uh, in capital. And then we were able to rotate all the investment back to these farmers and things just kind of seemed to steamroll and get on a good turn. The Leprino partnership was so successful that in 2005, the mozzarella maker initiated an early renewal of the initial agreement. Leprino bought out the cooperative's remaining interest in its assets and extended the milk supply agreement, ensuring a market for MMPA member milk for an additional 24 years. As president, Elwood Kirkpatrick is a masterful consensus builder and mediator and is called to Washington numerous times to represent the views of dairy producers. Certainly when I came aboard, Elwood was uh, a pretty predominant board member, not just uh, within the scope of MMPA, but nationally. Uh, we were recognized, MMPA was recognized uh, throughout the country as a quality operation that had uh, incredibly talented leaders that uh, not just were concerned about Michigan and the Michigan producers, but were concerned about the industry and established protocols that helped the industry become a better place, uh, certainly from a national perspective. Well, Elwood was quite a sharp individual 
and he conducted good meetings. I think that one of the things that helped Elwood, when he graduated from college, he didn't go back to the farm. He spent a few years in uh, industry working for Federal Mogul, and I think that really helped him out. He had a very good business mind, was uh, very um, fun to work with. In 1987, MMPA builds a permanent home in Novi. A year earlier, Deanna Stamp, a dairy farmer from Marlette, is elected the first woman to the MMPA board. Maybe I was naive, but I think that I stepped into it feeling an equal and being treated as an equal. Um, you know, I had a long history on our own farm of working alongside our men, you know, whether in the field or in the barn. and. Um, you know, always was accepted in our own operation. And uh, when I was elected to the board, I really um, didn't feel like I was uh, out of place at all. In 1991, MMPA celebrates 75 years as an organization by recognizing the William Bamber family of Howell and the Gordon Green family of Augusta for 75 years of family membership in MMPA. Harold Drake is honored for the longest individual membership. Drake started milking 14 cows by hand and is a member for 55 years. A year later, over a thousand people tour the renovated plant in Ovid. They see more than new equipment and upgraded facilities. They also get a glimpse of the cooperative's future in the form of new products that meet changing consumer tastes and a growing global demand for dairy protein. MMPA was shifting its manufacturing emphasis from an all-butter facility to one making more profitable ingredients. Ovid and Constantine are now the only plants owned by MMPA. The attacks on 9-11 delayed Congress from voting on the highly anticipated farm bill containing the renewal of the dairy price support system. Dairy sales declined and dairy product consumption dropped as the U.S. economy weakened. Having more milk than manufacturing capacity resulted in a shortage of customers for extra MMPA milk. Excess milk had to be shipped to distant markets at a distressed price. In 2003, John Dilland, the Director of Finance and Controller since 1975, becomes the General Manager. In 2007, Ken Nobis, a dairy farmer from St. John's and a board member since 1992, becomes President. But when I look at Ken Nobis and the transformation that has happened from era to era, Ken is a, is a strong leader in a, in a very recognizable force uh, within the industry and continues to be a voice of reason and uh, doesn't, is not afraid to question some of the directions that uh, we're going in, which is, which is good on behalf of not just us, but the industry in and of itself. A growing international demand for U.S. produced dairy products provides a new outlet for MMPA members' milk. The cooperative exported 20% of the butter and 10% of the non-fat dry milk powder manufactured in the co-op's plants that year. To take advantage, both the Ovid and Constantine plants are upgraded and production capabilities are expanded. I came from a finance background, so I have some understanding of what bankers are willing to lend and what members have an obligation to, to uh, support. And they have stepped up with uh, what we call an equity retain program, where members put money into the co-op in order to support the expansion of facilities or to help justify uh, borrowing additional debt to go about larger expansion, which we did in, in uh, 2010. That was a major undertaking for us. Uh, it was a $62 million expansion project, and I think we had $40 million or so of equity. So it took not only member capital to do that, but bank capital, and we had uh, excellent working relationships with our banks, and, and as a result of that, uh, we're able to put together a pretty good program. Here at the Constantine plant, we bring the milk in from the dairy farm. Once we've taken receipt of that milk, we will run that milk through a separation process and we'll separate the butter fat out of the, away from the milk solids. The butter fat then will be processed into fluid cream sales or it will be manufactured into butter. Um, the solids portion of the milk then is evaporated and it is sold as evaporated solids to, to customers as a food ingredient 
or we will dry those solids and we'll sell the, the dried powder as a food ingredient. Most recently, we have installed a reverse osmosis machine here at Constantine. Basically, that piece of equipment will take water out of the milk through a filtration method and we'll get a concentration rate of about three to one. The recent addition of the RO has enabled the plant to process more milk. Prior to the RO project, the Constantine plant could only process one million pounds of milk per day. With the addition of the RO, we can process up to two million pounds of milk per day through this plant. Well, you had the $62 million expansion in 2010 where we actually put the dryer in and that gave us the ability to turn roughly three and a half million pounds a day into non-fat dry milk if we want to. Then you've got the churn uh, expansion that we did where uh, we have one of the three largest uh, churns in the USA and that gave us the uh, ability to actually take our own cream where we would be selling it at stress prices during holidays or off season and we can actually turn it into a non-perishable that we can store and sell at a later date and leverage the uh, commodity prices on it if you will. Also new as a dual sampling station for tankers before they get into the bays to unload milk. Currently we uh, do butter, we do non-fat dry milk, we do whole milk powder, we do condensed skim loads, uh, this gives us the flexibility uh, to pre-sample and if there are any issues, we can pull the trucks to the side. That way every truck that is sampled here and released, once they pull in the unloading bay, all we have to do is hook up and unload, which will increase the throughput there. In 2014, Joe Diglio, a 23-year employee, becomes general manager and inherits a strong organization. I think it's a combination of, one, uh, having uh, the right resources in place, uh, the talents that, uh, that know a lot about the business. Uh, we have a strength within the longevity within the employee ranks. Uh, many people know a lot of things about the industry and not just about MMPA, but uh, nationally what's going on in the big picture and that goes from the board of directors down into the management and, and the employees themselves that, that work here. Um, on top of that is uh, understanding that there's a strength behind uh, the business, I meaning the, the financial statements and the, the uh, financial position of the organization uh, was very strong and managed very well and when you have an organization that uh, that pays attention to those things, you know that there's stability and there's reliance on a, a long longevity with a business model in and of itself. So uh, had the opportunities of working with the numbers and uh, understood that uh, it meant that this business was fruitful and uh, positioned to, to expand uh, for future needs and growth opportunities. In part three, MMPA reflects on the past and looks into the future.